today we're pleased to have with us uh, a stone carver. Uh, please welcome Karen Sprague. Lower the lights, um, and then we'll turn them back on again after the presentation. But mm -hmm. right there, just, just shut them off. Oh, here's the switch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are some wonderfully friendly faces. <laughs> Rosalie and I met 20 years ago Probably. with Fred at the Association of Gravestone Studies. And wherever I give a talk or a presentation, I bring some. AGS as one of the materials. So I couldn't find little flyers, so I actually brought some of our newsletters that if you're not a member of the AGS, but possibly the Historical Society is a member, so you're getting the newsletters. Okay, well, they'll, they'll get signed up, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> there are annual conferences, and that's where I met uh, Fred and Rosalie and got to read these, where I've been reading these great books on, on gravestone carvers. The people that wrote these books were at these conferences. So I have not been at this very long, but I'm going to um, walk you through some of the timeline of, of some of my early childhood love of letters. And while I'm talking through that, the portfolio is just going to roll with a little music from Anya Minogue from <laughs> Anya Minogue is a uh, harpist from Ireland. So let's see if I can make all this happen seamlessly. <laughs> so when I was little, like, I can remember three years old, just having this fascination with letter form looking at magazines, um, starting to draw them and realizing when you just draw an S and then try to double that S, it's all out of proportion and somehow learning to do a double stroke was a brilliant moment for me. Um, camping was something that we did on on one of six <coughs> and we traveled New England to camping and we would go into old burial grounds in Vermont and all through New England. And so from a young age, I loved the cemeteries. I loved it. it was the lettering, though, on the, on the stones and the stories that I would read. Um, at, after high school, I went off to art school, and I was a photography major. And I realized um, a year and a half into that, that wasn't a match. I really didn't know what I was supposed to do. And I moved to Block Island. I ended up living there for about four and a half years. But while I was there, I rediscovered, remembered, my love for lettering when a friend was opening a restaurant and said, would you paint my sign? So that was in about 1983. And I painted this sign for her and then realized, wow, well, I, I, I'm okay, I'm pretty good at this. I really love this. And somebody else has to paint a sign. So for about three and a half years, I had opened this little sign shop and um, did, did very well for myself. And still loved the, um, the cemeteries, Block Island has the most remarkable cemetery if you've been out there. Next time you go out there, spend time there. While I was painting lettering uh, with sign work, then I met a wood carver and I was carving wood and painting letters, painting boats, the transoms on boats. And I did learn never say yes to letter somebody's boat that's still in the water. <laughs> Trying to, to outline Jack Spot was the name of that. It was not, it wasn't the neatest. And so then I um, met someone, married, began to have children, moved to the mainland, um, put a little pause on the sign work, but by then I was wood carving and realizing I loved that um, and was carving wood signs. And somewhere in about 1991, I met a teacher who was a wood and stone carver. And so he invited me into his studio and I had a six month old at the time. And he said, um, if you'd like, come back tomorrow and I will teach you how to carve a letter in stone. And I had been carving wood for about 12 years. And so I came back the next day. My mother-in-law took care of my six month old. And he had said to me, uh, 
lay out some letters that have some curves and some straights. So I had laid out a G and a D. I love those two uppercase letters. And then I put an O in there. So my first commission, when I got to David's <laughs> studio and I laid out the G, O, and D, I'm like, I did not! I did not! I did not! So I started carving this G, and he says, well, you've got quite the client for your first commission. <laughs> and um, so I finished the G, and he had said, you know, I'm working on this sign for St. Sebastian's. It was this beautiful church in Providence, and he was doing the slate stone that just said St. Sebastian's. And he had this small tablet that said, it was already laid out, masses, and then it said Sunday, Saturday, and had all the times. And he handed it to me, and he said, you know, I'm swamped with work. Could you finish this? And I said, David, I've only carved the G. And I said, uh, you've got this. I, I know, finish the O and the D, and then get on this. And I went home, sky high. I had really recognized something within me had ignited. And there's this poem from Pablo Neruda, and something ignited in my soul, fever, or forgotten wings, and I went my own way to decipher that burning fire. And that fire that I met when I met David and, and I met when I was cutting letters in stone for the first time, I knew I need to go down that rabbit hole. And I'm not sure where it's going to happen, or what I'm going to find there. So I carved masses, ended up having two more children, so now I've got this beautiful brood of three children. And, in 19, and, I, and as I was carving masses, I had um, a real clear understanding. Wow, this is nice. I'm doing a sign, a piece of sign. I've got a great seat for you right in front of me. And so um, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be something to carve someone's gravestone? Who's going to hire me to carve a gravestone? I'll stick with signs, I guess, for now. But certain friends had asked about a dog. And I remember carving a bed. And then in 1996, my father-in-law died suddenly. And it was there that um, I had attended my, very near there, I had attended my first Quaker meeting. And it was sitting in that worship that I heard a message that, you know, you have been given many gifts and talents, and you must pursue them. And I sat with that message, um, and what was clear to me was that I needed to carve my father-in-law's gravestone. And I asked my mother-in-law for permission. She said, that would be lovely. And she knew I had never carved a gravestone, but she had complete faith in me. And I sat with her, and I said, tell me about Fran. And through her telling me about his life, I designed something, all in slate, carved from top to bottom, and we set it out on Block Island. And it is um, there today. And the um, Providence Journal, so that was in 1996, did an article about this girl hand carving this slate stone. Mm -hmm. And it truly was not a studio. It was a garden shed that I had, <laughs> would call a studio. And um, many things were happening though at that moment. I was feeling that leading to carve gravestones. I, I needed a house that had fire. I wanted a bigger studio. And you know when you ask the universe, watch out. And everything started to happen. And found a new house with um, a beautiful fire, a fireplace, a beautiful larger studio. My first apprenticed, apprentice had come and met me at a carving demonstration. This woman. She was only 19 at the time and asked if I was hiring. And I said, no, I'm actually just watching me carve my second gravestone. <laughs> um, what I think I jumped over was the Providence Journal did this article about this girl carving this gravestone. It was the first stone for my father-in-law. And that article came out, and the phone rang. And I spoke to this woman in Connecticut who then said, I want you to carve my husband's stone. And I want to take the marble of his sister and his other aunt. I want to take those out and replace those all with slate because slate lasts longer. So I got this commission now to do four more. And um, she met with me at my studio, a new studio, trying to put it together, but it was working. I had a new apprentice. And the work was just happening. So the, that stone happens over in Connecticut, in Colbert, Connecticut. There's a row of four stones. The one is for her husband. The other three are slates that we removed the marbles. And the conundrum was, well, what do we do with these upright marbles? And being the careful AGS person, I was like, well, you can't just put these in walkways. They'll be discovered 70 years from now. And 
I said, let's open up the earth in front of where we're going to put the slates. And we laid them down. Each one of them were laid right in front of the slates. And the death dates are 1947, this, you know, 1962, and I was born in 64, so I realized if somebody's looking at these, they're just, oh, Karen didn't carve these. She wasn't born until <laughs> But another thing that Gravestone Studies Group has taught me is to sign each stone. So at the bottom or on the back of each, um, it says Spray, Citra Road Island. Early on, I, I did live in Harrisville, so the stone from my father-in-law Block Island says, um, and that's when I cut and wrote out Karen Spray. Harris <laughs> the moment to cut just the signature is 45 minutes, and now it's just <laughs> spraying, situ right on. And so you'll see out there stones that'll just say the name of the shop, White. And it may say Providence, you know, it said that, but let me pause that. I think if I just close that down, and I'll just keep sharing a little bit more of the story with you. And so the work starts to really roll in, and I a second apprentice arrives, Tracy Mahaffey. She's now been with me 18 years. Um, she has since shifted into creating her own work under her own name without anything to do with me. And it's, you know, it takes a little while for a small little shop to grow. And then it was David who said to me when I brought on my first apprentice, I called him and I said, David, I have this woman who wants to apprentice with me. What do I do? And he says, well, Karen, he was a very Zen kind of guy. He said, let's work backwards. Eventually, she'll leave you and be your competition. <laughs> so that was Christine Wheeler, who arrived probably in 1998. And um, dear Christine did, uh, maybe it was 12, 10 years ago, I got a call from her mom. She had died suddenly in the night. Um, mm -hmm. Her father had dropped dead from a heart murmur or something, and she might have had the same. Um, she had already had left the shop and had gone back. Um, there was a couple other apprentices had come in. Um, and so she had phased out. We had a couple other carvers had to come in. She wasn't working in the shop at the time that she had died. But she was significant in that learning curve for me to say, how do I share this work? What do we, you know, she asked. And she just seemed so sincere. So I'm sure I said, I, you know, I'm learning too. Um, so together, I did have an understanding of layout and calligraphy. But where to get stone, how to rig it, you know, how to deal with each cemetery has its own rules and regulations. Some are like, oh, I put an orange cone over there, so just put it over there. <laughs> Others, Catholic cemeteries are so strict. Don't park here, don't park there. You know, we'll put in the foundation, the guys will handle it as soon as you bring it through the gate, send us your insurance papers, this and that. Um, so, and we travel now across the United States installing stones for mm -hmm. families. Five years ago, I was invited to Ireland to mm -hmm. carve lettering on a boulder with a sculptor friend of mine, um, Alexander. I brought one of the flyers that has that. And you could YouTube that video, I think. I think it might even be connected to my website. What happened with that stone was we were called in um, to create a memorial for those that the sea had taken. So imagine you're a woman or a man or You've lost your mate because they've gone off fishing. They never come back. And so there is no place to go into the cemetery to honor them. They may have put up a stone, but um, sometimes they didn't. And so on this little island, it's the first of the Aran Islands. Um, Alexander had gotten to know one of the, um, he's actually the castle repairman in Dublin. It's good to have one of those in your Rolodex. <laughs> and so Patrick, um, Mahaffey, um, Patrick, rolling out his last name, it's a Mick, Mahat. <laughs> oh. And so Patrick said to the um, man who ran the pub there, who was lamenting the loss of one more friend, one more mate who didn't come back, and Patrick, and he said, I need to have a monument made. And uh, Patrick said, I have the woman for you. And he tells Alexandra. Mahaffey. McAfee. Patrick McAfee is the, is the Dublin Castle repair man. And so Patrick says, Alexandra Morosco. She's in Seattle. So Alexandra and I have carved together at different symposiums. These are festivals where carvers come together and certain carvers are invited. And so Alexandra has invited me to several of these. So she gets the commission to carve this monument. She calls me up. She says, she says uh, we call each other sister. 
Sister Karen, because we, we have this little joke like we're from some monastery, but you know, we don't follow anybody's rules. <laughs> so she says, Sister Karen, and uh, she says, you know, do you have your passport ready? And I said, it is. She goes, we're going to Ireland. She says, and she tells me where. She goes, uh, you know, I, I have this idea for the sculptural parts, but you do the letter. You know, you're the, the letter master. I said, I'm in. So she tells me when. We, we get the shop all sorted, so work is underway. And off to Ireland I go with Alexander. We live for three weeks in this little thatched cottage, no bigger than this room. Thatched, truly thatched. And every day we'd ride our bikes down to where the stone was. And um, we met, so I, we, we had met up with um, the uh, bar owner, Ned, who was commissioning us to do this. And, he, and I said, tell me some stories of of your mates who have gone out. He himself was a fisherman, and he ran a pub with his wife. Fabulous food, and um, we would meet there every night. Open tab. I learned to drink Guinness. <laughs> uh, and Alexander came up with these concepts of this open wave. And I started doing some lettering. I knew what they wanted me to write, but then when we were presented with this boulder, lots of craggle. It was a limestone piece, but it had raised areas. It had wasted areas where there's no way lettering was going to go on that. So she was pretty clear where she was going to put this wave. I started to lay out just with pencil where I would put the lettering, drew it all then on paper, transferred the letters onto the stone, and we get carving. And then there's gale force winds. They set up tarps for us. One day I'm in my little, little hat carving, and she's using pneumatics the whole time. And I'm there with my mallet and chisel. We're, you know, 20 inches from each other. And I just didn't look up, you know. We just, wow. and by this time of day, I would always get on my bike and, and chase the light. And you would just ride to the top of the island where there's castles that are in ruins. And horses just kind of all around, you know, around. Um, and by the end of that third week, I was transformed. They had moved the stone out to this holy location, right on this real volatile edge of the island. And they've, we veiled it with an old sail from one of the ships and that they would fish on. And so there's this veiled rock. There's a pierce through it, you know, and the sun is setting, so you're seeing this illumination. And one of the men from the island has brought out his tin whistle, mm -hmm. Father Mahaffey or whomever is there, and, and he gives the blessing. They unveil it. The, the pipe is played. Dogs are all about. Children are playing. It was the one of the holiest unveilings of a monument I'd ever experienced. Um, grateful, grateful to have had that experience. And with each family that calls me, there's this, tell me about him. And I just say, you know, tell me about her. If a mother comes for her child, I'll say, Bring me pictures, you know, and we'll sit and tell me about them. And whether the you're coming and you're telling me about your father who died at 97, bring me pictures. Tell me about what you think you know of him when he was nine. And, and it's in that storytelling that I'll design pieces. So you saw all these various um, images. And so it's not that when you come to the studio I'm going to show you a catalog and you're going to pick something from it. It really matters that you tell me. Tell me about your mother. And yes, what sometimes happens is they'll say, well, she loved rhododendrons. Or, um, she, I would love a flower on that, so then I'll pull that out of them. Tell me about what she really cultivated. And we'll, we'll include that. So one story I wanted to share with you um, is from a mom here in Massachusetts who came to me. Um, I was doing a carbon demonstration in Monterey. Well, no, it was Tyringham in that valley. And she came into the room where I was carving. I was doing an artist in residence program. And she told me this later when she called that when she came into the room, it was all she could do was just sit and watch. And then she touched the stone and she was there. And she just couldn't bear to discuss anything with me. And she took my card and walked out. And then she called and she had said that her only son had died. And would I, I want, she said, it's been 10 years. And, um, I saw an article that you would be carving at this place, and so um, I went, I watched what you were doing, I touched the stone, I had no idea that it would be that warm, and that you would be doing it with such care and love, and she herself was an artist. 
So I, I said, well, I'll be up at Hancock Shaker Village this next weekend doing a, a carving demonstration. If you'd like, we could meet. I'll say hello to you, and then we'll set up, you know, if you want to continue with the commission. All right, she said, is there anything I can bring you? I said, well, okay, bring me some tea. And so I was carving, and if you've been to Hancock Shaker Village, you know it's a holy ground. So I'm, I'm working, and across the field I see this woman coming with a thermos. And I know it's not Peggy. I said, oh, that's got to be Peggy. And I realize what's about to transpire, and I do kind of sort of ask the universe, all right, give me the ears and open my heart to hear what I'm about to hear. And we take two chairs. I move away from where I was carving. I said, well, let's go sit out in the light. And she, her hands are shaking, and she's pouring me a tea, and we start to sip some tea. And, and um, I ask her what her son's name is, and she says, it's Brian. And so then I said, well, you know, you could come to the studio, and we could discuss this a little bit further. Or, And she just goes right in to deep and just starts telling me about Brian. And I said, I'm thinking to myself, well, we could sit right here. <laughs> and, um, well, it was um, a real difficult conversation for me to hear. It was her only son. He had taken his life. And then she went on to just talk about the pain, but the beauty of this boy. And at some point, I realized I, I just kind of left the scene, kind of left my body and went up. And I said, oh, this is too hard. I do not want to hear one more hard story. I can't do this. And I heard this little very subtle, quiet voice said, yes, you will. This is the work you said you would do. Get back down and listen. <laughs> and I went and listened. And I really listened to Peggy about Brian. And when she was done, there we were, knee to knee, finishing this tea. Her <coughs> hands were still shaking, but I was probably holding her hands, and she was holding my hands. We were probably both crying. And I said, yes, I'll carve in stone. Come to the studio. Bring some photographs of him, and we'll design some. So when she came to the studio and brought some photos of, of Brian, um, his, there was a photograph on here of it. Um, it's a very narrow, tall stone, what we had eventually designed, with a pierced arch cut right through. And at the top is an infinity sign. Mm -hmm. And Brian's name is there, his um, birth date, which is May 28th. And through the design, through the commission, through the conversation, she said, well, Karen, I want my stone to be somehow incorporated with his. I don't know how. She said, you know, he needs to have his own stone, but I want to have my stone there too, but I, I, I don't know if mine is under his, connected. Um, and somehow the idea came about to connect it with light. Mm -hmm. So I can't recall exactly how I came to that. With her, probably. She, we came to this. So what is there now is this upright, thin slate stone, probably two inches thick, with this very elongated arch through it. And then on, in front of it is a flushed marker with Margaret's name, and her birth date is on there. And at the moment of his birth, which is 4 o'clock on March, on May 28th, the light, so we had to take his stone. She, was, she knew somebody that could orient, know which, do whatever, I needed to pitch it so that the setting sun was going to pierce through that elongated arch and rake across her name. So the light from his stone would illuminate her name at the moment of his birth, 420 on May 28th. So you could go there today and stand there at 420 on May 28th. So on the day we were installing it, it was early May. It was, you know, getting close to the 4 o'clock hour. Um, the sun, I could see when we were starting the foundation work and, you know, was up. And then when I looked where the sun needed to be to pierce through was a wall of evergreens. <laughs> 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 Solid wall of evergreens. And I thought, oh, I didn't factor that in. <laughs> um, but I kept working and I kept working and I would look up and I would look up and there it was. There was this crack, like opening where probably a limb had fallen from <laughs> snow or lightning. Oh, I said, Really nice, Mr. Sun. Right there. <laughs> Don't you know at like 410. Oh, wow. But now it's cloudy. It's completely cloudy. And Mar and Peggy has arrived to do the, you know, we were done. I had called her and I said, come to the site, we've set the stones, and we'll do a little check. We'll see if we can see this. And in order to get light, I did like the <coughs> old camera. I put I veiled the stone over it to create shadow over hers, and that allowed enough light. So I could see that, yes, it was going to happen. Um, 
Jan's wondering, how did I do that? Yeah. What did I do? So if Todd, if you stand up, and so if the light was coming through here, right, right through here, <laughs> so I, I put, and here's Peggy Stone, I put, like a cloth, light. I put a cloth over that and then over her stone, and so the light was coming from back there, and enough came through because the sun was over there. <laughs> so, so with that creating shadow, I got enough light because it was so cloudy. Then, we clean up, we put the tools away, she brought out this little amulet and laid it over the stone, and the clouds moved away. Mm -hmm. And the sun pierced through that hole mm -hmm. and illuminated her name, and we just sat there like, oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so little big things like that happen to us often in the shop, whether it's when I meet somebody for the first time, or I come up around the corner at the cemetery, or there's just that, that love connection that happens. And then there's that mystery that happens. And I say, OK, I'm, I'm in. I'm staying in this. I'm, 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 I'm with it. Um, people ask, you know, how do you get your work? What? And so yes, it, we've evolved. You know, In the beginning, I would show up, and I had my carousel slide projector. And I always had a second one, because the bulb would always blow out. <laughs> you know? And then you know, I met somebody who was doing videography. And he said, well, let me try this. You know, so I didn't roll the video for you. You can see that on our website. So yes, we have this website now. We have the studio. I'm still in the same location. My children are launched and grown. And uh, you know everything changes. Everybody in this room knows that. Nothing is the same. Nothing stays the same, whether it was yesterday, today. And so um, we are blessed with work. And the website draws also word of mouth. And so he, I'm here tonight because I invited every about around the end of October at Historic Deerfield, and I do a, a day-long carving demonstration. I bring an actual stone that I'm working on, and you were there, and your daughter was there, and somehow they got me here. <laughs> and uh, so I drove the two hours up here and said, yes, I'll do this. And so I brought with me a finished stone for Vivi and Jonathan. This is setting um, somewhere in the middle of this month to Newton Cemetery, and it is slate. It's, being, uh, it's flush to the earth, so it is a little bit thick. Upright, I would never carve, uh, have something milled this thick. Um, so it's green slate. A lot of my stone is black slate coming in from the UK. They don't blast there, and so they're step quarry. Um, I've recently reconnected with a quarry in Maine, Monson Slate. It's considered by many of the older carvers the frozen butter of, of slate, the most beautiful homogenous. So we have a stone right now in the shop we're working on for that. And um, <coughs> the a little note here to, to note on to, to close. Um, so articles are written so that people will call or someone will cut out an article that was written 10 years ago in the New York Times and I'll get a call and they'll say, you know, we put that in with our will and my husband said, he rolled off the couch when he saw you on the CBS morning show and, said, and, and I rolled off the couch when I got the phone call, you know. No. But um, I didn't know really what the CBS morning show was when the director called and said, we're doing this series on grave uh, stones at the Greenwood Cemetery and someone there said, we should come up and, and to your shop. And I said, sure, and then we're going to come next Tuesday. <coughs> and what that led to was the phone ringing and ringing um, a, little, a little too much. But um, people who saw that noted it and, and, and called us years later, years later. And um, I hear the most remarkable love stories. You know, they're hard to hear, but, you know, <coughs> They'll bring me letters from their from their spouse, and I just I get to hear how they met. I get to hear how they raised their children. I get to hear how uh, this happened or that happened, or a second marriage, or just beautiful love stories. And and, and the, it's really hard, but I know I'm I'm I, I'm continuing to say yes to this work. And so um, there's a quote that I saw, um, and I wrote it. It was. Caring is the ultimate competitive advantage. So, so caring. And so I, I, I care deeply 
with each stone that I do and each stone that I set. And um, I'm grateful for this work. And thank you for coming out to listen to this story. Um, and if there is, perchance, call me. You don't have to speak about it tonight. You can call me next week or if you'd like. But I do have some contact information that if you'd like. I did say I would carve. I think the sign out front says I'm supposed to do a carving demonstration. So I would love to do that. And I brought a stone. Maybe we can turn the lights on. And you're free to mingle um, or I'll carve. And I really wasn't sure what I was going to carve. I brought a piece of paper. And I thought, oh, I'll just carve a letter. And um, what I hope you gather is that it's very quiet work. We, we don't use pneumatics in the shop. We draw all our letters, we transfer the letters onto stone by hand, and then we carve them by hand using a mallet and chisel. So up here I brought a tool roll of all different chisels. Over there where I'll be carving, I'm just going to use a mallet and chisel. I brought a piece of paper, I'm going to draw that letter, and then I'm going to transfer that to stone. I'll show you how I do that. It's with Sorel paper, which is like a carbon paper. And we all know what that is, but talk to somebody who's nine and they do not know what carbon paper is. <laughs> and so the white, 29. <laughs> the white uh, Sorel will be slipped underneath and I will then transfer that letter and then I'll be, and then I'll carve that. But are there any burning questions before I move into that letter carving part? Um, so when you're working with wood, you know, the piece of wood has a, a way of adjusting. Do you find the same with slate or it's a flat and a, you can do whatever you want to do with it? No, it'll tell you. It will. It'll tell you. <laughs> so the question is, when I'm working with wood, you know, if you've worked with wood, you know, there are, there are you're, there, you can't go against the grain. It right. won't carve nicely, no matter how sharp your chisel is. And with slate, there are layers, and, and if you're going to cut the edge, you have to know you're on the end grain, and you cannot hit it a certain way, it'll cleave. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, you have to feel it. Rosalie was a student of mine for an entire day, taking stone carving <laughs> classes. And, so, and these two gals also took classes, and Tom has taken the class, and, and they say, gosh, you make it look easy, and then they get the chisel in their hand, and it's not as easy. And, um, but if you go slow and you just put in the time, and it takes about three years from when an apprentice can get up to speed and not think so hard all the time about where the hand is, where the chisel is, am I coming about, am I too steep, am I hitting too hard? And the stone actually speaks to you. You'll have this ting ting, too high of a sound. I'll make you some sounds. And then um, if it's too low, it will um, it'll be too dull of a sound. Karen, on Block Island, what sort of native stone do they have there? Do they have some granite. they use? They There's use this beautiful orangey granite. And it's probably, you know. Can you carve in granite? Yes. Really? When you're carving in granite, there's silica, so you have to wear respirators mm -hmm. here with slate. You know, for cutting and creating tools? a big boom. Mm -hmm. Using the same tools? No, not the same tools. Good question. The carbide on the tip of the granite is um, a different tungsten. That's not the right word. It's uh, it just tempered differently. That's it. And then it's uh, shaped um, more dull because you're crushing the crystals in the granite. Okay. You're really not cutting. So the slate, they call it letter cutting. Karen, can I ask a couple of questions? Sure, well, I'm uh, going to draw a letter. Is slate your favorite stone to use for Slate more? is the very favorite. It's the best. <laughs> and, and because you can pull such detail out of it, and it's that memory of, of um, as a, you know, just look at these old s sections of the cemetery. Aren't they the best when you go, when you find the slate section? And, and how, my second question, how, how long typically does it take to do a, uh, a stone? We're talking about weeks, months, a couple of years? Well, it depends on what's being, what's being cut. If you're just doing God, it doesn't take long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, better be right there. Depends how big. No, some, some can be a few days, some can be a few months. You know, it's, uh, so I've traced very rudimentary with my double pencil trick. I don't know if anybody saw that. So you get your thins and thicks. So you, typically you would, um, I was really wild when I saw this as a young child. You'd put your elastic around it, and if it's fixed at that point, 
and you're drawing your straights, well, that's your straights, that's your thicks. But if you're doing an S, well, that's how you're getting your thins and your thicks. And you're getting that really great proportion. Yeah? And if this were a G? You have to have Ticonderoga pencils. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do have straight lead. This one is good They have to have hexagonal shape. So then to transfer this, so we would do a layout in vellum, and we would do an overlay to make sure our spacing is just right, and, and then, you know, double check that we've spelled God right. <laughs> <laughs> There's one side of this that has the powder on it, and one side that doesn't. So now I've slipped that underneath, and with a stylus, not a ballpoint pen, I'm just scoring over the lines that I made. I've taped that piece of paper in position so it doesn't scootle about. C became a G. Do you have a favorite typeface character? Oh, I, do Celtic. Type I do love the Celtic letters. I do love the Celtic letters. So the G. Do you actually use typefaces or just... No, but those are books. Hand. We'll right. reference, we'll look through yeah. Herman Zapp. So sure. we're just, we're looking at calligraphers type. Mm -hmm. right. we're, I'm, and yet my first letter set look, I was wowed by just calligraphers. These names for things, Palatino, Optimo, these forms that I've always loved. Whether it's serif or sans serif, I'm cutting you a sans serif so it does not have the little feet on the bottom of it. Um, look at this little box here. You know, I, I'm just crazy about letters. And so you'll see some that are serif, some are not. There's italic. And then there's a different weight. So when you're in the cemetery, I remember coming across that the most incredible sensuous eye in memory of. But the eye was done with this sweep and huge. Because he was a she or he was a calligrapher when they So it's a carbide tip chisel. And you cut from the center of the ch of the stone. Raking side light, yeah. so I can see, and I, and I can actually see what I'm doing. But the sound that you're hearing is what's happening in the studio. And usually there's the sound of the radio. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Does your hand ever cramp up? No, because I'm holding so loose that I could pull oh. that chisel right out. And so I'm carving upright, and when I teach students, we carve flat, just so you can move the stone around. But as soon as possible, we want to be able to transition to an upright position. So you can do inscriptions in situ. So the overhead light is difficult to really see my center line, but I'm giving you a little bit of a sense. So tonight I was at the Hadley Cemetery looking, there's beautiful forms, just these great squiggles, and they're done the same way. You know, a squiggle would be um, just designed, and you'll see these great patterns, you know, whether it's just something like that, and they're just repeated, and look really close, and they're V-cut in there, and you look even closer, and you'll see a tap line, and what you're seeing are the striation marks of every time the mallet hit the chisel. So when students are learning, they start with just a straight instead of a curve. And I'm just trying to get them to get a feel for the stone. And so they'll they'll begin by just cutting a straight, and if they're too steep, you get that funk yeah. on the side. Really. And if you're too shallow, you're not taking any stone out. There's nothing, nothing being cut. So there's this really, there's this 
stop. And the stone is cutting. And I'm coming from the thins into the thicks. It's not about speed when I'm teaching someone. It's just about being really careful and going really slow. Because once it's done, nobody cares how long it took you. They just want to know that it's beautiful. Sure. They're just looking at it like, oh, you really blew out the bottom of that egg. You know, and, but if you go really slow, you won't. You'll just take out what you wanted to take out. And um, yeah, I think I'll not keep going. I could just keep going. You're not even there. And I'm like, oh, I'll just keep <laughs> do, you try to get, do you try to get to a certain depth usually, or does it vary? Good question. So do I try to get it to a certain depth, and does it vary? Yes. So the thickness of the letter, the thickness of the letter, the width, determines the depth, uh -huh. because the angle is always exactly the same. Whether it's at this very thin part, so when you go out into the cemetery and you look closely, or look really close here on the lowercase letters of Jonathan, um, and the depth is determined by the width, so the wider the stroke is, the angle is still the same, so it'll go down farther. Okay. This has a nice combination of raised letters and V-cut letters, and what's great about that, you'll see in the marble that's out there, you can read a raised letter in the marble so much better than, there might be the most incredible poems written out there in those marble stones, but unless we go out with a mirror or at night with a raking light, we're not able to read those anymore, so the light has to be perfect. But with the raised letter, your, your, your shadow is there. And that's what it's really about, is to make black in, in the, the letter. So you're free to come up and touch this, as long as you don't have french fries. <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, you're welcome to call me next week if you have questions, uh, although I won't be in the studio till Monday. We are actually on our way tomorrow morning to Virginia to go set a stone and then move a little bit farther south into Upperville, Virginia to hand carve a woman who, I brought the drawing of her stone, Linda Newton, who loved rhododendrons and um, I wanted to have it done for her children for Mother's Day. So she commissioned a stone for her husband four years ago and then came back to the studio two years ago to do her stone. We got it all done, and I think it was in the fall we went down and installed her stone, and she died on March 24th, and I got oh, the call yes. from her kids, oh, my and I said, I'll be there. So I will be in the cemetery adding, um, died March 24th, 2018, Marshall, Virginia. So her stone, where it says she was born, speaks of the place of her, of her, um, of her birth. Unlike many stones, which is fine, just a birth year and a death year, and a dash. We try not to do a dash. If, if we're just doing the birth year and the death year, um, you'll see in the portfolio, I'll put a little icon of something, whether it's an mm. acorn or a symbol of your faith, or I have put the dash in there, but <laughs> sometimes a dime. a symbol of our faith. <laughs> but there's that poem, How Did You Spend Your Dash? Yeah. You heard that, right? That's a good poem. Oh. And so, um, thank you for listening, listening, and, and you know, if you've got that show at 8 o'clock, you want to get home to it, hopefully we'll <laughs> <laughs>